Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. In this episode, our time machine travels back to the birth of modern Israel. When we arrive, we'll follow its return to statehood, beset by enemies on three sides and their backs against the sea on the fourth through the eyes of two fictional brothers and the woman they love. Our guide on this journey is Martin Fletcher, who brings us Promised Land, a novel of Israel. In this first book of a three-part series, we'll meet characters shaped in very different ways by the darkness of the Holocaust. As a teen, Peter escapes Nazi Germany for America, Despite hopes of a reunion, the family he leaves behind perishes, all except younger brother, Ari, who survives to reunite with Peter in the newly proclaimed Jewish state. In those early days, Peter protects Israel as an agent for the Mossad. Brother Ari builds it as a businessman. And then there's Tamara, an alluring Jewish refugee from Egypt, seeking a new life in the reborn nation where she can hardly speak to people because there's not yet that shared language. The love triangle between these three vivid characters spans the first 20 years of Israel's modern existence, as war, intrigues, and jealousy threaten to tear their lives and the infant nation apart. You've seen Martin Fletcher's work as NBC News Bureau Chief in Tel Aviv, and he's earned recognition with the National Jewish Book Award a Columbia University DuPont Award, several Overseas Press Club Awards, and five Emmys. His previous books include The War Reporter, Jacob Zoth, and Walking Israel. Visit him at martinfletcher.net or facebook.com slash martinfletcherfpage. Okay, now that we've arrived back in the flood of refugees returning to their ancestral homeland. Let's join Martin Fletcher and explore his latest novel, Promised Land. I'm joined on the line by Martin Fletcher, author of Promised Land, a novel of Israel. Thank you for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Hey, Dean. Hi. The founding of modern Israel is such a unique moment in history that when they sent me Promised Land, I said, I have to check it out. I have to read it. I love historical fiction. Here we have one of the very first states going back many thousands of years. It's lost for centuries, and then it's reestablished. You get this resurrection story that's often trampled under other politics of the moment and propaganda, not to mention all of the World War II stuff. By the time we get around to the establishment of Israel, people are exhausted. They assume maybe that they know what happened. So what better way to talk about it than in a historical fiction novel? You're a journalist, though, and your job is to inform the fiction writer. Your job is to entertain, which you did here. So how did you combine those two skills in your previous novels and specifically here in Promised Land? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, you say that my job as a journalist was to inform and as an author to entertain. But I would say they're both a mixture. You know, when I was working as a journalist, I was very conscious that most people that I was reporting for or to didn't really care about, you know, the subjects I was interested in. So it was was my job to make my 
my reporting as interesting and entertaining as possible to keep people listening, you know. So I was very conscious of telling a story when I was reporting. And in the same way, when I'm writing, which, as you say, basically, it's an entertainment. You know, you sit down with a book and you want to you want to be entertained. But I want to inform as well through my fiction. So I, I combine the two. I always did combine the two. And it's very important to me now when I'm writing fiction to have a point to it. You know, I'm writing fiction because I want to tell a story about a place and a period that I find fascinating. And so I kept my novel as accurate and, and as authentic as possible. You know, and that's the journalist in me. I, I think it's a better story when it's as accurate as can be. I like what you said about how your job is also to be entertaining, especially here in the U.S. I know when I work in news, you try to get somebody to take a story that's about a foreign place, and it's hard to get people to, to want to tune into it. They don't really get it, so it requires getting to the right place, having the right backdrop, making it interesting to people. There was a line by Louis Rukeyser that I've used a few times that a woman wrote him and said, I know nothing about the stock market. I don't invest at all, but I'm sorry. I just watch you because you're entertaining. And he wrote her back and said, Madam, I'm so disappointed. I demand you turn off your TV at once. The people that watch, I want them to be bored. And you know, I don't want you to just be entertained. And of course, that was why this little tiny show on PBS became such an icon because the guy was entertaining and even if you didn't care about what the market was doing or about ADM supermarket to the world or any of these big companies that you'd never heard of you found it entertaining and I think that that's what you accomplish here in promised land where somebody might pick up the book that wouldn't read a whole book on the history of Israel if you could even stuff it into a single book but they'll pick up a novel and be entertained and then sort of like when I was in veterinary medicine and people know you've slipped the pill there into the piece of cheese so that we're getting some good facts as we devour the novel part and we're not just getting the strict facts of a place that maybe we can't really relate to no that's right as they say a little a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down right? <laughs> there you go and that's what I was trying to do as a journalist you know, people don't really care about the stock market or aeroplanes or buildings. People care about people. And so that's what I try to do as a, as a journalist, tell stories about people in order to make the information more easily digestible. And, and I got to say that carries over well into writing fiction because the stories I'm telling about Israel, I think are really, really important and interesting. But I'm aware that many readers may not find it so interesting. So what I got to do, first of all, is entertain. I have to tell a good story about people that the reader will care about. And that's what I set out to do in Promised Land. And I, you know, I hope I succeeded. Yeah, it's something where you may never have heard of it, and yet you can pick up a novel and you know the human stories of it. And that's what I liked about it. You have conflict, which is the key when you're telling any story, especially a novel, and you bake plenty of that into Promised Land. You have the character of Tamara, who I mentioned in my introduction that she's coming from Egypt, so an entirely different background from these two brothers that are from Germany. You use the term yak that I learned in Promised Land, and I think I pronounced correctly Y E. Yeka. 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 Okay. Y E K K E. <laughs> they look down their noses on her having come from Germany. And again, if you're not from the background, you don't think of the different divisions. You look at Israel there as just a blade of, of land that's then you assume everyone is is together it's actually one of the things that's that's twisted into bias against people from israel one of the stereotypes you people don't think of them and then they don't think that in any nation there's french canadian and english canadian people from the outside don't know that there's a big divide there between them over the century and a half or so of canada's existence so give us some of your background research what was the experience of a refugee like tamara when she arrives in the early days of Israel? Well, first of all, I was able to relate to it because my parents are refugees from Austria when they went to England in 1939. So that whole question about being a refugee and a Jewish refugee is something that was very real to me. And then also the whole story of Israel, is it's such a struggle. You know, um, you mentioned earlier about the, the extraordinary history of the, of the place, which ended with the, you know, the Holocaust and and the World War II and, and, and the history of the Jews. Um, and then they arrive in Israel finally to build a country out of almost nothing. And one thing we forget is how difficult it was for the period, for those people who arrived, the pioneers. And that's what the book is about. It covers the first 20 years of Israel's 
existence. And one of the main problems at the time was that the Jews who ran Israel were mostly from the West, you know, mostly from Germany, Austria, Poland. And there were, of course, many Jews who lived there before the state of Israel. But another 800,000 Jews came from Arab countries, from Yemen, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Iraq. The Jews from Europe kind of looked down on them. You know, they weren't as sophisticated and as cultured as the Europeans. In fact, they were very sophisticated and cultured, but in their own cultures. You know, it was a, it was a different culture from the people who ran the country. So, the, yeah, so the Western Jews, the Ashkenazis, looked down on the Eastern Jews, who they called the Sephardim, Sephardic Jews. And that was a source of great tension, which was, and it's been, it's, it's, there's still some tension even today, even though there's pretty much a lot more equality today. But so that's what I wrote about. The two German Jews, the key figures in my book, uh, come from Munich. Um, they, they made their own ways to Palestine, where they met up again after the Holocaust, and they begin to build the state of Israel. And they fall in love with the same young woman who is a, a, a Jew from Egypt. And for me, the reason I did it that way was I wanted to set up the conflict between the Ashkenazi Jews and the Sephardic Jews, the Western and the, and the Eastern Jews, and tell that part of the story in the early sections of the book, because that was key to the growth of Israel, the key tension. And, um, you know, one of many tensions, you know, while Israel was struggling to, to, to defeat the Arab armies that were attacking it, they were also struggling in, internally in terms of finding out, you know, just building a country from nothing. I felt as I was reading Promised Land that this felt very biblical, the story, that love triangle you just described between the two brothers, Peter and Ari and Tamara. That's perfect for the setting. And I wondered if you intentionally built the plot that way, which you just touched on a little, or if it's just that that ancient nation, that part of the world really lends itself to those timeless tales of love, loss and betrayal. I was trying to make the comparison between the brothers and the young woman they fall in love with. But, you know, a lot of people ask me when they read the book whether I had meant that as a metaphor, that one brother was a Jewish nation, one brother was the Arab nation, and the the girl they fell in love with was the land of Israel. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> that's yeah. great what people said, see, right? <laughs> You're writing. I said, no, it never occurred to me. It's a good idea, though. I wish I had thought about that. <laughs> it wasn't intentional. It wasn't intentional, but... As you say, the subject lends itself to that kind of interpretation because it's such a big, epic story, the land of the Bible and the brothers jealous of each other and the young woman they fell in love with. You know, it is almost a biblical story. And I was conscious of that while I was writing, that the small story of two brothers and the woman they love is really the small story that tells the big story of the nation and the struggle. So I was very aware of that. That's why I did it. That's what they say in history, uh, where you work from small to big. As a fellow that I was meeting up with the other day at Simon & Schuster to get some books, and we were talking about what sells and what doesn't sell on the market and what people like to read. And he says the couple of people that tell the story of the bigger war, the bigger struggle, that's what always draws us in. And what you were just saying there about that love triangle is so illustrative of that because you look at them and you say immediately the setting, the theme, the place they're living, the times they're living in, you can't help but immediately put them in there and have it all blend together in your mind and think, I see something more in that than what you intended. As it turns out, if we didn't know you weren't able to speak to you, we would just be left assuming that that was what your intention was when it wasn't. The brothers, as you said, both born in Germany. Peter escapes to America to grow up there. So here's another cultural divide between those two brothers. What do you think surprises readers the most about how people from so many different backgrounds, without even a common language, united only by this ancient faith that they may not even have been able to be free to practice in other countries before they got their own, only that unites them at all. They're so different. They help their nation plant roots on what's literally and figuratively inhospitable terrain, what do you think surprises readers that maybe are reading about Israel in any form for the first time? Well, first of all, imagine this. You're a Jewish refugee coming from Europe or from Russia or from America, from anywhere, and you decide you're going to go live in Israel. And Israel's only one or two years old. You know, there was nothing. The total exports of Israel in 1948, when it was founded, was $6 million. And it was almost all oranges. <laughs> so there wasn't much there. Wow. It's surprising. Then they all had to learn another language. They all learned Hebrew. Hmm. That's pretty extraordinary that before you can even begin your life in the new land, you've got to new, learn a new language. And everybody's learning the language at the same time. 
So I, I found that extraordinary. There were many things that are extraordinary about the period, mostly the fact that everybody came with nothing. You know, there were, nobody had anything. It was Everybody was poor. Somebody once said to me that in those days we were all in it together. We all wore sandals. And if you were rich, you wore better sandals. <laughs> that was the extent of it. And that's what I wanted to bring out in the book. You know, one of the brothers becomes a billionaire in the book, and I wanted to explain how it was possible at that time to do that in such a poor land. And while the other brother was a spy with Mossad protecting the country, and what did he do in order to protect the country? So, you know, I tell the sort of the small stories of the two brothers and their love affairs, and also I tell the stories of their careers. And so the stories of the love affairs is, is the personal story that pulls you in, and that I found intriguing myself. But their careers, their developing careers, tells the story of the developing country. You talk about the founding and about building things, and it reminds me of our founding fathers in the United States, which is often a parallel that's made because they're inventing everything from scratch. They don't have anything, but at least they do have that common language. They have the common law, literally British common law. They have that in common. But here you have people, and it's almost like going to the moon would be if you were forced to go to the moon and you only had these few things, you had to start a whole new colony there. If they, let's let's at least give the people air. It's so much where you're saying you're going to rebuild people. It's all, almost like gluing a vase back together after it's shattered <laughs> into so many pieces and been cast to the wind. And that's what is done here by David Ben-Gurion, somebody who shows up in your book. He is the modern founder of Israel and served as its first prime minister. I'm Curious to the reaction of cameos of people like that, an Israeli leader who's very revered, who has legendary status. When you bring a character like that into your book, I imagine for a moment, maybe you take a pause and say, okay, I'm going to put words in his mouth or make her be in a scene that wasn't true to life because this is historical fiction. You have that license to do it. Do you have to take special care? So Nobody says, oh, he would never act that way or is pulled out of the moment of the story of the book because it seems out of character. How do you approach writing about somebody like David Ben-Gurion? Well, yeah, no, that's very much an issue. And I suppose that when you're writing historical fiction, you know, based in, the, say, the 16th or 17th century, you probably got a lot more freedom because who, you know, who knows how they spoke in those days, right? But yeah. if, you're, if you're talking about more recent times like David Ben-Gurion, and I mentioned other people, you know, the, you know, the, the, the head of the Mossad, for instance, and army chiefs of staff and whatnot. Well, there are many people alive who remember them. So, yeah, it's very much incumbent upon me as the author to get it right. And so I did a lot of research. And when I put words in people's mouths, it was all based on conversations that I knew that they had. And when I described people, it would be a, I would be very careful to make it a very accurate description. That was the research that I, I love that. I mean, I love doing the research. I spoke to lots of people for this book. I actually began Promised Land as a, as a non-fiction book, but it became a novel. And so I did a lot of research. And then when I turned it into a novel, that research helped me to get make it as authentic as possible, which is always my goal in all my novels, historical novels, that they should be as authentic as possible. I am glad that nobody came to you and said they were sucked out of the moment because it's a good story and that kind of thing could make you put it aside. For me, I remember reading a book one time, historical fiction, and they had Theodore Roosevelt going to a house of prostitutes. And I said, well, he didn't even believe in second marriages. I said, <laughs> you know, he he was uh, that kind of guy. He berated himself and berated himself after his first wife dies quite young. And he says, I'm, I'm not going to get married again. I'm against second marriages. It's like having my wife and family in New York City and a, another whole family up in Albany. And so things like that, if you know the figure, and it's a beloved figure like David Ben-Gurion, you might not want to read about him doing something or saying something that you just say is out of character. It could even just be a, an anachronistic term. It's a minefield that you walk through a little bit, I'm sure, when writing about somebody like that. Yeah, no, but I enjoyed that minefield. And I mean, in my, se in my second novel, Jacob's Oath, I wrote about a character who was eating an apple on the Lunenburg Heath in May as he was walking through Germany in 1945. And the only comment that a German friend of mine made after he finished reading the book was he said, there were no apples in May in Lunenburg Heath. It's the wrong <laughs> season. <laughs> so I said, that's all you got out of my book. you know. <laughs> but it's true. The, if, if you get those little details wrong, it breaks the spell for the reader who knows who has that information. And you lose the reader's confidence. So it's very important to get it all right. And as I say, that because I enjoy the research, and I was a journalist, or still am, that's one of my strengths, probably, is to do enough research to make it sound right. And yet you actually put the words down in print, which is an important 
part of it. You have to know when to stop researching and when to start writing or else you'll never get it done. No, that's right. I mean, some people, let famous writers say that research is, is just a crutch. Yeah. <laughs> and you sort of just keep going. But I enjoy the research, but it's absolutely true. At a certain point, you've got to sit down and write. My goal is to write a story in which there's no research at all. It's just all out of my head. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there wouldn't be historical fiction, I guess. Yeah, maybe your own life story. And even then, you have to go back and check because we don't remember everything perfectly. Throughout Promised Land, you use Yiddish terms also. Talk about research. For somebody like myself, being Greek-American, I would have to go back and look up some of those, although my parents did both work at a Jewish school for a time, so they've picked up quite a few. And my mother comes by way of London, where she was born, so she's this Greek lady with the slightest of English accent, and she'll occasionally slip in a Yiddish term. And my wife said, well, <laughs> how did I get how did I get this from this woman? Like, she's so unique. So the, the, <laughs> these are terms that are sprinkled. And it's I heard somebody say that uh, Yiddish is the language of comedy here in the United States. So at least in the New York City area, other Jewish areas were familiar with some of those Yiddish terms. And they're so much fun just to sneak one in like I did earlier with that term, Yeke, the name for the German Jewish people that come to Israel. But I'm always interested in how authors strike the right balance with slang terms like that because you can't overuse them. So imagine my delight when I'm reading Promised Land and I come across this scene with Ari, the businessman of the two brothers, and he's sprinkling in so much Yiddish into his conversation where he's trying to tempt this government man. He's trying to schmooze him and get him to invest in his idea and the government man agrees. He says, this is a great presentation. You have a great idea. And then he tells him, you know, maybe you want to tone down the Yiddish a little bit <laughs> because you're just using so so much of it because this does, again, what good fiction, what good dialogue specifically does. You accomplish so many things right there in that little exchange, advancing the plot. You tell us about his background. You tell us about this divide where this man who comes from outside, who comes from Germany, does Ari that he needs to ingratiate himself, he feels, and be like, I'm a real Israelite, even though that's not clearly defined yet exactly what it is. So I wanted to ask about that scene, if I asked you about nothing else, did I catch one of the things you were trying to accomplish when crafting that scene where you wanted to get your terms in, but explain why, as you're supposed to do when writing dialogue, you're not constantly slipping in terms, especially for people like myself who might not know what all those Yiddish words mean. Yeah, no, that's a, that, first of all, thank you. That's a great summary of that scene. And, and, You're and I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah, no, first of all, when you throw in foreign words, it can become a bit tiresome if, it, if it's too, to the reader, if it's too much. On the other hand, I love Yiddish. Who doesn't, you know? And it's interesting thing about the Yidd Yiddish. Of all the languages in the world, and like, you know, in, in uh, America is this melting pot of hundreds of different languages. And you're a Greek American. You never really hear people talking outside your own community about what Greeks say, you know, what Turks say or what Danish people say. But Yiddish is a language that people are always quoting. That's true. It's such a colorful language. You know, I need this like a hole in the head. You know, that's a Yiddish hmm. phrase like a locking cop. In Yiddish, a locking cop. So, yeah, so um, I wanted to have fun with that, but I also didn't want it to become tiresome. And then I thought, well, I overplay it. And then the, you know, exactly as you described it. And then the, the Yiddish person he's speaking to will say, hey, hey, <laughs> Hold on, you don't have to be so Yiddish, you know. <laughs> so he was trying hard to be Yiddish, you know. So yeah, no, it, 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 you've got to be very careful when you're when you're using foreign phrases in literature because it does become tiresome, and it becomes like who, who's this? You know, the author's trying to show off with all his knowledge, you know. You don't want that. But I thought that was a lovely scene. Personally, I had great fun writing. I've got to say. Oh, I had great fun reading, and I was going to mention to listeners, I have a big smile on my face. I'm realizing as you're telling it because that was a lot of fun and a very human moment, and it avoided you having to do what some authors will do, where they'll put a list of terms in the front of the book so that you can go and refer. But if you're going to take that moment, it literally takes you out of the flow of the story. If you have to go look up what one of these words mean, I much prefer if you just use it in context as you did there. Plus, we get to be inside Ari's mind when he's thinking, oh, well, what's the word for that? Oh, I'll, I'll use this. Let me use it. Let me. That's part of his pitch. And we see he's really passionate about his business, a real three-dimensional character. And for me, I love the nuts and bolts of it. I love speaking to you and hearing that you planned it that way so that we wouldn't be flooded with those terms. And if he uses one again, every time he uses one in the future, 
we think back to that scene, we remember that <laughs> chuckle. We remember why he's doing it because he wants to fit in. I don't think I've ever read a book of all the novels that I read that that was that was so perfectly tied back to that and justifies, for lack of a better word, what what happens later when they use that language. We're so much more forgiving of him because we're rooting for him. We understand why he's using those terms. Yeah, because he's also a, a very well, all the characters are very multidimensional, but Arya, the businessman, is a real, is a, he's a real hard case. You know, he was, he survived the concentration camps. He's got sharp elbows. He want, all he wants to do is get rich any way he can. But he's partly a very nasty guy, but he's also somebody you can understand why he is the way he is. And that scene with the, with the Yiddish scene, it made us sympathetic to him. You know, we, under, we, we sort of understood who he is. It was a, it was a window into, into who he really is. You know, he's not just a, the tough, nasty businessman. He's, he's a sort of a fellow trying hard to survive in this new land. And so I thought that was a nice way of, of achieving all that. You're enjoying my conversation with Martin Fletcher, author of Promised Land, a novel of Israel. Visit our guest at martinfletcher.net or at facebook.com slash martinfletcherfpage. Historical Novel Society magazine writes, quote, Promised Land is a sweeping novel of personal and national evolution within Israel as it attempts to forge its respectable, permanent place in the local, national, and international communities. Readers will immediately become engaged in this memorable, well-crafted work of historical fiction. As I read that review, I thought of John Lennon's lyric, Life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. There are so many threats and obstacles for your main trio of characters. We've touched on a few of them already, and there's a mountain more. There are challenges for anybody who falls in love, much less falls in love with the same girl that their brother happens to be in love with. Those threats, those obstacles, do you think that the story in Promised Land has something to teach readers about balancing our own challenges in life when everything seems to be going so crazy in the world, it's easy just to sit and watch the news with all due respect to what you do during the day and what I do during the day, daytime jobs, talking news, talking politics, what's happening around the world, about unplugging ourselves from that enough so that we're still advancing and living our own lives. Do you hope that after somebody finishes that last page of Promised Land, they say, well, these people have gone through all this, these characters, and yet they still were trying. Whether they fail, whether they succeed, they at least tried and they lived lives. That's an interesting summary what do I want readers to really feel after they finish the book? I want people to, uh, to sympathize with what Israel is today. You know, today Israel is a country with great problems, but it's also a, a country that has achieved great things. And the, the question Israel faces today is how to translate its great success into a lasting, livable arrangement in its environment. In other words, a peace tree of some kind. And, she, and yeah, and I think that does apply to everybody in our own lives. We all face obstacles and we all face challenges and we trip up sometimes and we don't always do as well as we wished we, were, we had done. You know, we make mistakes, but we always carry on. And the one thing that defines all of my books has been the, something which defined me as a journalist too. I was always interested in what people did the day after some kind of tragedy, you know, when something bad happens. What do you do the next day? How do you get on with the rest of your life? And that's what Promised Land is all about. It's all about getting on with the rest of your life and making things better for you and for your friends and for your family and for your country. And we all face that every day. And one thing I noticed is when I'm you know, reading the news today and following what's happening in America and around the world, it's pretty grim overall. And yet we all try and translate that into our own lives and just enjoy life one day to the next. And I think that's all we can do, sort of try and be better people and help the people around us. I mean, that's what I've always done as a journalist, or tried to do, and I hope people take that away from the book. As you're speaking about getting on and enjoying life and living a life, the Yiddish terms again, it's a language that's born out of struggling, and it has that cynical edge to it. And it's so universally human, that experience, that this is why the language catches on, as you were mentioning. This is why you'll hear people who couldn't be farther away from, from being Jewish, who have no experience in it, have, have never been there, maybe even have never met somebody that's of the Jewish faith, and yet they know these words, and they know the words 
in context because it sounds like it. You know a word schmuck. <laughs> you know you're not being complimented when you're called that. <laughs> so so that's part of it. It sort of gives a language to that, to that idea of no matter how bad things are, if you're having a little bit of defiance, a little bit of humor, a little bit of resistance to feeling bad through your language, that works so well there. I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. Of course, you know, Yiddish is basically a sort of a part Polish, part German. It's a language that grew up in the shtetl, the people who were in the, in the ghettos, in the farm and the Jewish farmers. And, you know, there's a lo another lovely word, shlemiel. You know shlemiel? He's, he's sure. A, he's a foolish person, a shlemiel. It just sounds wonderful. <laughs> La Laverne and Shirley. I was humming this song to myself as I prepared to call you because I had the Yiddish in my mind. So there you go. Shlemiel Shlemazel, right? Hasa Pepper Corporate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a funny thing. There's a Yiddish theater in New York, which is which is really wonderful. And I went, I went to see one play there. And there was one guy who was just fantastic. His Yiddish was perfect and he was hilarious. And uh, I actually met him after the show, and it turned out he was a Christian from Texas. <laughs> wow. He got it perfect, though, huh? Yeah, he fell in love with the Yiddish language, joined the Yiddish theater in New York, and he's a goy from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so That's great. It is universal. It is wonderful. And the more I could you know, get into that into the book, the better. We talked about Ari there. His birth name is Aaron Berg, and he changes his name to Ari Ben Nesher, which translates to Lion Son of the Eagle, which, as I reread the question, I said, man, that, that's a really tough, you know, badass name, as I guess you'd say. Yeah, and this isn't even the brother that's in the Mossad. It tells you a little bit about his trying to maybe equal his brother. Maybe something I'm reading into it is those other readers you mentioned, but that's still great fiction when it gets you thinking about a character and why they choose a name. The Jewish people traditionally have walked a line between blending into nations and maintaining their own identity. You spoke about that when you mentioned about Yiddish and how they make those languages their own, combine them into something that they speak. That's a form of assimilation, and yet it also makes them stand out, makes them able to retain some of their culture through a slang version of other languages and amalgamation. How does changing the names of the characters or how the characters change their names reflect the story you wanted to tell in Promised Land? Well, changing your name is, 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 a, is a thing that, you know, Jews travel from country to country throughout their history, and they always try to blend in, and they change their names. And, for instance, my, my father's name was Fleischer, hmm. which means butcher in, in German. And then when he came to England, he changed it to Fletcher which means arrow maker. <laughs> huh. So he changed it from Fleischer to Fletcher. And everybody in my book, The List, I, I, I had a funny scene that I found funny of all the, all the German Jews in, in London in 1945 trying out names and what, what would they call themselves in, the, in England. And so in Israel, it was interesting. They changed their names from all kinds of you know, weird, wonderful Polish names to names like Son of the Eagle, Lion, Duby means bear, in all these strong names, because and what it reflected was that the Jews were trying to re reinvent themselves in Israel. They came from Europe, the Holocaust survivors, defeated, beaten, or they had run away before they were lucky enough to get out before the Holocaust, and they they were refugees, and they came to a new land where they were became farmers and and soldiers and politicians, and so they were reinventing themselves. You know, those sort of the cultured, literal, literate Jews from Europe had to become farmers and, and soldiers and reinvent themselves and reinvent the nation. And that was an amazing change for the Jewish people. And it, it ended up in this strong, strong, dynamic country they have today. So their names were the first step in doing that. And when the, when the Jews came in the beginning, the, the local political Jewish leaders made them change their names. They huh. said, you know, get rid of Shtunitsky. They changed their names to something that would be a rough diamond or sort of you know, strong as a rock, Seller, a friend of mine is called Seller. He had, his name was Pasternak in Poland, and his name in Israel was Seller, which means the rock. <laughs> huh. So, they, you know, yeah, they were using their, their names were the first claim to their new personas, if you like. It was a rebirth for them, too, in a way. Yes, a rebirth, exactly. I wanted to mention another thing that we touched upon a little bit for the experience that people have when they come, as Ari does, from Germany from the concentration camps, he survives. It never would have occurred to me that people would 
want to look away from him, that they wouldn't want to talk about his experience. Because today, if we hear somebody's a Holocaust survivor, we revere them, at least here in the United States, or I'll just maybe I could just speak for myself. But we do have the Holocaust Museum. Millions and millions of people have traveled there to go and, and see this experience. So you would think here you have a living person there, you're of the Jewish faith, you're in Israel, and yet Ari writes, or you have him thinking that he could never mention his experience in the concentration camps to anyone. Quote, if he did, people's eyes dropped. They looked away as if it was a crime that he was still alive. You have him explain later that people wonder, what did you do to make it through with your life? How did you go about fleshing out that backstory, which, as Ari says, he keeps hidden in shame? Well, that's a very important part of the, of the Jewish story after the Holocaust. And as you, as you know, you mentioned that there's many Holocaust museums in America. I'd be interested to know, and I'm going to find out later on after we finish this chat, when the first Holocaust museum was established in, in America. I'd be interested to know when that was. Because in Israel, um, it was a guilty secret. The, the Jews who died in the Holocaust, in the eyes of Israelis, the new, strong, pioneering, fighting, soldier, farming Israelis, those Jews who went who died in the, Holo, in the Holocaust went meekly to their deaths. They, the, the phrase they used was, they went like lambs to the slaughter. Why didn't they fight back? How could six million people not, not resist, just allow themselves to be put to death? And for the new, st- strong Israeli, that was an embarrassment. So those Holocaust survivors who came to Israel didn't broadcast the fact, even though remarkably, when Israel went to war with the Arabs in 1948, when they were attacked by six Arab nations, one out of four Israelis who died in, the, in that war were Holocaust survivors. They survived the camps, joined the army in Israel, and then, and then got killed in Israel. So they, they made a, a major contribution, but they were ashamed of, of what they had. They, I, I think that it's not too strong to, to use the word shame. But they certainly didn't want to speak about it. First of all, they went through horrific experiences that, that would totally traumatize them. That's one part of it. And the other part of it was that if you survived three, four, five years in a succession of concentration camps, you weren't Mr. Nice Guy. You know, the, so the, the nice people died quickly, and the people who had sharp elbows and, could, and were strong-willed uh, were able to survive, and they did some horrible things to, in order to survive. So it wasn't something they were proud of. But they survived. And it really wasn't until 1961 with the Eichmann trial. You know, Eichmann was the, um, the man who carried out the final, so-called final solution, the extermination of the Jews. When he was finally captured by Israelis in Argentina and brought back to stand trial in Israel, that was in 1961. And that was the first time that the story of the Holocaust survivors was really told in great detail in Israel. And after that, the attitudes changed. Before that, the guy, the bus driver with the Auschwitz tattooed number tattooed on his arm, you know, would, he would he would wear long sleeves and cover it up. And after that, they started to wear short sleeves, and they were not so ashamed of their numbers. And as you say, today they're revered, very revered members of society. But it wasn't like that in the beginning at all. Another reason to change your name and another reason to completely commit to this new nation, even learn the new language, is they wanted, I guess, just to be part of this new whole without even knowing what this new whole was going to be, what the new nation was going to be fully. They'd never lived anywhere else, but they were going to learn and find out what it meant to be a new Israeli because they were leaving behind what was so terrible. And this is a book, Promised Land. It sticks with you. You keep thinking about it. I know I'll keep it prominently on the shelf, which I'm not able to do with every single book that I have because I have so many of them. But one that makes you think. And then when you hear about things happening in Israel in the news, you'll think back to something positive, maybe something funny, and you'll understand it a little better, which is important. Yeah. So that was my goal, to try and explain what Israel is today by looking at, at the struggle it, it went through in order to become what it is today. And by the way, Promised Land, as you know, I think it's the first in a trilogy. It covers the first 20 years of Israel's existence, and the next one will cover the next 20 years, and the third one will bring us up to date. Yeah, so a lot of people felt that Promised Land ended rather abruptly, but that's because it sets up book two. <laughs> Well, you know what? I did not know that. I'm finding it out for the first time. But what I do with a novel is I try to stop about three quarters of the way through, so I won't give too much away. So during, it's taken us months for various reasons that to get together here and speak is I've been waiting. I've been waiting to finish it. So now I know that I could have gone all the way to the end and it would have just been the end of the first part. I'm so excited to learn there's going to be two more books. When, when can we expect the second one? 
Well, I'm not sure, but let me tell you, okay. if you're three quarters of the way through, I think the last hundred pages are the best. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It also, it also comes together. I'd love to hear what you hear your thoughts when you finish it. I will. The, ne the next one, well, I'm, I'm writing now, but probably a couple of years, I should think. It, it takes time, unfortunately. It takes so much time. I didn't realize how long it takes to write a book. If I'd known, I'd never have started. <laughs> well, we're fortunate that you did start. I'm glad that you were. <laughs> I'm glad that you were ignorant of the fact of how much time it would suck out of your life. Yeah. I like to ask novelists to share a short passage from their book and read it for our listeners. What you choose tells us something, as does dialogue, about what stands out to you as an author, what you're trying to accomplish. It also gives listeners a flavor for the fiction they'll be enjoying when they read Promised Land. So set up this package for us and have at it. So the, the bit I'd like to read is from the beginning of the book where the two brothers are separated. Because the whole book is about... The, the relationship of the two brothers. And this is the moment where they're separated as children. One is 12 and a half, one is 14. One is being sent off to America to escape the rising Nazi anti-Semitism and what, of course, became the Holocaust. And the rest of it, and his other brother stays behind. So this is what I'll read. At the train station, Aaron tried to cling to his brother while Peter cuffed Aaron around the head and gave him two of the butter biscuits that Mama had baked for his journey. Pappy and Frau Bildner watched the brothers hug. Her lips quivered, and Pappy had to look away. There were whistles and clouds of steam and people rushing with trolleys piled high with cases, and men in black leather coats with swastikas and guns scanning faces, examining papers while their dogs strained on leashes. All along the train, guards pulled up the iron steps and slammed heavy doors as passengers waved from windows. Peter leaned out too as the engine lurched forward and picked up speed. In one hand, he gripped the paper with the name of the person who would meet him in Hamburg and take him to the ship for America. With the other, he waved to his father and Aaron. He wanted to shout, I love you, but was too embarrassed. Goodbye, he called, the wind whipping his hair. See you in America. Pappy tried to shout, go west, young man, but his voice caught. We'll see you there, I promise. With a long, thin whistle and a screech of wheels, the great metal machine rattled around the bend, and Peter was gone, a trail of smoke rising behind him. So for me, that trail of smoke rising behind him was kind of a nod to what would happen to the family, which was that they would basically be gassed and then their bodies burnt in Auschwitz. Because that's what happened, you know, when people, when the Jews in Auschwitz uh, or those other camps with the gas chambers, they were told when they arrived, they said, the only way you're going to get out of here is up, it's through the chimney. Uh. So that, yeah, so that line that I wrote at the end of it, what I just read, a uh, trail of smoke rising behind him, you know, it referred, of course, to the, the steam of the engine. But I thought some people may get that reference to the family and what would happen with them. When I think of the two brothers, I think of that moment in the car when they're driving to the station and they're together. I just, I remember them in the, in the seat and they're together next to each other and he's holding on to him and on all these things. And I think that because you write that scene that way, you are able to see them in the future and you, you still have, as we talked about you building that character and you say they're, they're rough on each other. They're, they're mad at each other. They have every reason for Peter to knock his brother out and, Yet you see that early relationship where they're just like any other two brothers. I mean, I'm a youngest brother myself. I have two older brothers. And when you get older, things aren't so easy. You don't always get along. You see things differently. Maybe in their case, you fall in love with the same girl. Or it could be the same job. It could be the same bike. It could be you feel your parents treat you differently. But we get to see the good times for them there, even though there are these clouds hanging overhead and you you give us there the, the vision of the Nazi officers that are standing around. And so we know that it's going to get bad, and it makes their bond even stronger. I realized as you were speaking that as I think about the two brothers, I, I'm always drawn back to that moment when they say goodbye and they promise they're going to meet again in America with the whole family. And then because they lose the whole rest of their family, they're pushed even tighter together. They're all they have left. Yeah, and and it's a very and it was a very common story, you know. I mean, everything I wrote, all the all the issues and dilemma I raised in the book are issues and dilemmas that were faced by the country by many people. So that idea of two brothers, or maybe it's two sisters, or maybe it's a mother, a mother and a, a daughter, you know, just a couple of people left out of a big family. Everybody else was murdered. So what does that do to your relationship? You know, you have to love each other, and yet 
hey, you know, li life intervenes, things happen, and then you you fight. But you're always drawn together. It's a, it a tremendously deep intimacy, even among warring warring family members. You know, life is life's tough, but they make the best of it, and that's what this, the book's all about. It's about the struggle of the brothers. It's about the struggle of the country, and it's about the ultimately redeeming aspects of of, of all of it. That love, you know, <laughs> love conquers all. Which I I've got to say, I believe in life, and I all my all my stories have been sort of dramatic big stories but they're basically love stories i wanted to squeeze in as time dwindles one other famous historic figure that shows up in promised land and that's reuven shaloa the founder of the Mossad, for whom peter works you write of his penchant for secrecy quote it was said that when a taxi driver asked him where he was going shaloa told him to mind his own business <laughs> and when I read that line, I just thought that that was fantastic character development for him. And it, it tells you everything you need to know. And I've actually quoted it because, as I mentioned, I've had a couple of months here since I read my three quarters of the book to speak to people and people that are very secretive, especially people that are, say, on political campaigns that I speak to or work for prominent figures. And I've mentioned that a couple of times. I read it in this great book, Promised Land, this line about the founder of the Mossad. Is this clever writing on your part that helped you flesh out the character, or is that an actual anecdote, an actual quote attributed to him that people said? It's a funny thing, you know, because I sit here breaking my head when I'm writing, trying to come up with funny, clever stuff, and I never do. <laughs> no, he really did say that. that, that or rather, or rather it's, it's said of him that he said that. I, I sort of nicked that from somewhere mm. else. But yeah, he, he, he allegedly said that, and he certainly was that kind of person. <laughs> There's also that thing about when he recruited Peter to the, to the Mossad, the idea that he was almost blackmailing him, you know, threatening him with all kinds of horrible things if he didn't join the Mossad. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's pretty realistic. <laughs> yeah, very different meeting than, than the goodbye with his brother. He walks in that office, and you're going to do it, and he's just in awe of this guy and intimidated by him. And he says, hey, you're, you're no different really than the land in a way when he comes to him. If you need to use a knife as a screwdriver, the knife isn't going to complain and say, but I want to be a screwdriver <laughs> because our lives depend on it, right? So this is it. Yeah. And he answers that call and he pays for it, as people will learn reading the book. Yeah. Well, the, but see, yeah. So Peter joins Mossad and he's protecting the new country. And Aria becomes a builder, very super rich, and he's building the country. And so, so the two brothers' lives parallel each other in pleasant and also painful ways. And again, that's life. We have time for one final question, and I want you to speak directly to listeners who may know nothing of Israel's rebirth and not think this story speaks to them. Why should a reader who is ignorant of Israel's struggles for statehood and maybe isn't really interested in it, they'd rather read a thriller or something like that, although this book is very thrilling, I'll leave it to you to say, <laughs> to say that, but you may be too modest to, but... If they don't think this book matters much to them, if they only have limited time to read, why should they pick up Promised Land to enjoy this story? Well, Promised Land is a love story, and it is a thriller, and it's also a very accurate account of the first 20 years of Israel's existence. And we hear a lot about Israel in the news, and it's, it's, it's sometimes good, and often it's not good. But the extraordinary thing to remember is, what is Israel? Israel is one of the great political romantic dramas and adventures of the, of the last 2,000 years. You've got these Jews who left and thrown out 2,000 years ago, remembered, prayed next year in Jerusalem, and finally they actually made it back to their land and built their country. And it's a country with major problems, but let's not lose sight of the extraordinary achievement of, of this tiny, tiny country. You know, they got... I mean, the Jews have, I think it's like 0.02% of the world's population but they have something like 30% of the Nobel Prizes. It's extraordinary. And so they go to Israel and they build a country and they tell an extraordinary story of survival against great odds. But they've got a lot to learn too. Israel has tremendous problems and they've got to make a deal with the Palestinians. They've got to live in peace. And what this book does, I think, is tell the beginnings of this story. It sets the foundation for what Israel is today. So it's an important story. And I hope that it's a love story and a thriller too. Well, Martin Fletcher, author of Promised Land, I'm so happy to hear that there's going to be a second and a third book. That's a that's a gift to me personally as a reader. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and for introducing us to these vivid characters. If you're a reader or even if you're just a writer and you want to be able to see how great historical fiction is crafted, enjoy meeting these vivid characters 
while they're going through the painful contractions of Israel's rebirth. I wish you the best of luck with your novel, and I hope that you'll find the time to get to work on that second one soon. Now that I know that it's coming, I'm going to start nagging you for it. I'm going to start really (laughs) checking my email to see when I hear from you about the next one coming Mm -hmm. along. I hope readers enjoy it as much as I did. I hope we gave them a flavor of that today. So much more to read in it. So many great moments to enjoy, especially at a time of ignorance where the Jewish experience seems to be really not known about, seems to be under attack, seems to be called illegitimate is the word that people use. This is the people that if you have a heart, I think you'll you'll root for them a little bit because we, we all share it, as people say. The Yiddish, the Jewish culture, the Judeo-Christian ethic that started with Judaism predates all of that. It's amazing. Maybe it's the Greek experience inside me that I find a kinship with people who've been pushed out of their land, gotten their country back, been driven to all sorts of ends, yet held their culture together to rebirth this ancient land. You'd be a better person, and you'll know a lot more, not just about Israel, but about good writing here if you enjoy this book. So thank you again, Martin Fletcher. I really appreciate all the effort you went through and your time today. Dean, thanks very much. I enjoyed it. The pressure is now on for book two. (laughs) Yep. I hope you'll want to chat with me about that one, too. I'm ready. Thank you very much, Dean. Appreciate it. Again, the book is Promised Land, a novel of Israel. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even navigate via the Amazon banner at the top of our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, that banner takes you through to Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend, and it won't cost you any additional guilt. For just those few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Martin Fletcher for joining us and for sharing this novelized version of the first 20 years of modern Israel's rebirth. We'll look forward to the next two books in the trilogy that bring us up to the present day. Visit martinfletcher.net for more or toss our guest a like at facebook.com slash page. And while you're at it, Let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, on Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. And if you are checking us out on social media, look for the picture of Promised Land alongside the single malt scotch whiskey I was enjoying that night. Mr. Fletcher left a very nice comment about the picture on Facebook And I appreciated that. I love the opportunity to interact with authors and ask them questions. And I appreciate all of you being out there to hear me ask those questions because without you, there'd be no reason for these authors to speak to me at all. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and shalom. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before.